Okay, hello everyone and welcome to Customer Talks. It's an honor and pleasure to be with you. I'm Jason Cardozzi, Leader for Global Partnerships at Sato. Thank you so much for joining us. This is our fourth Customer Talks, Talks and our topic today is sanitation and hygiene in humanitarian settings. The world is experiencing a spike in humanitarian needs. According to the UN's Global Wash Cluster, we are at an all-time high with over 270 million people in need of humanitarian assistance. This is driven by climate-related and natural disasters, public health emergencies, and conflict. In the WASH sector, this has governments, aid organizations, and the private sector working on how to better position our assistance to sustain support. At SATO, we are assessing the extent which our sanitation and hygiene solutions can continue to serve humanitarian settings, and how we can innovate through our local networks based on the changing needs of our customers. Like many organizations, we realize this can't be done alone, and we need to work in partnership to prepare, respond, and achieve sustainability. To explore all this today, we have a strong lineup of presenters with different perspectives and experiences. Next slide. We'll hear from Aaron McCuster. Aaron is the Senior Vice President and Leader of Sato and Lixel Public Private Partners. Brian McSorley, Water and Sanitation Advisor from Global Humanitarian Team at Oxfam. Tanoi Dewan, the WASH Sector Lead at BRAC. And Daigo Ishiyama, Sato's Leader for Innovation. And if we could just jump to the agenda, thank you. Please feel free to type your questions in the chat box at any time. We will do our best to answer them there or live just after the presentations. A quick reminder, this webinar is being live streamed and recorded. And with that, let's get started. I'm very pleased to introduce our first speaker, Aaron McCusker, here to give us context for our social business and these events. Aaron leads the businesses and initiatives across Lixel to deliver on Lixel's purpose of making better homes a reality for everyone everywhere. Aaron is orientating the Sato business for its next phase of growth in product innovation, business models, and geographic reach to drive our goal of improving the lives of 100 million people by 2025, including those with humanitarian needs. So Aaron, you're very welcome. Take it away. Thanks, Jason. And let me add my welcome to all of you joining um, from all over the world. So thank you for making time again with us today. As Jason was saying, our customer talks are just a great way for us to step back and really look at a particular issue or a challenge that's facing us in the WASH sector. And one of these in particular is the humanitarian challenge, which is very different from some of our past topics of financing in the local markets or even school sanitation. So I'm really grateful to be able to have representatives from Oxfam and BRAC and from Daigo from our own team to be able to share more about this unique setting and some of the challenges that we face. For those of you who don't know, Sato is a brand of Lixel, and Lixel is a maker of pioneering water and housing solutions. As Jason mentioned at Lixel, we have a purpose of making better homes a reality for everyone everywhere. And at Sato as a brand, we empower everyone to live a better life every day through our innovative sanitation and hygiene solutions. 
Over 10 years ago, we launched our first product, the Sato Pan. And the Sato Pan has an innovative trap door that enables us to provide a safe, enjoyable experience using less water that was an improvement over the pillatrines and the technologies in the past. As we've evolved as a business, we've continued to look at where we can bring innovation to be able to tackle these challenges. And as a private business, we're looking to see at how we can be investing in building the sanitation economy and starting to tackle our own global goal of accelerating access to safely managed sanitation. As Jason mentioned, over 270 million people face immediate sanitation challenges in a humanitarian context, but we know that globally, 1.7 million people are still overall lacking access to basic sanitation, with about 500 million still needing to resort to open defecation. So we as Sato look to see how we can come in and help to solve that first problem. How do we improve access, make that decision to choose to use the toilet, an affordable one, an enjoyable one, and an accessible one? And for us, getting the individuals into the system and enabling us to then look at a holistic system of sanitation in a community is the first step to accelerating progress to safely manage sanitation. When we now think about our product portfolio and how it's evolved over the last 10 years, I'm very pleased that DIG will be able to share more of those solutions. The SATA toilets in our connection systems have come a long way. We've been able to incorporate the consumer preferences of our markets in Asia and in Africa in particular, where there's the areas of highest need. So now we offer not only a single direct bid solution in our SATO PAN, but connection systems that enable offset solutions, uh, as well as twin pit systems that can enable safely managed sanitation and interfaces such as a raised seat, like a stool for an inclusive option tailored to more consumer preferences and even launching into new categories such as the hand washing station of the Sato tap. Now, what does this mean for the humanitarian challenges? We know that our products have been used in these humanitarian and emergency settings. And we wanna really take a deeper look at how these applications have been done, what can we learn from them, and how our newest products, such as the Sato Slab and the Sato Pit Liner, can help to make those applications even more affordable, accessible, and easier to install. Overall, we at Lixel and Sato fundamentally believe that private sector can play an important role in accelerating progress on our global goals. And I think that it's really important we hear from partners about where it's working well with our products and where we can continue to invest in innovation. So I hope that you all have an opportunity to hear more about the real world challenges being faced in the humanitarian and emergency context and learn more about some of the products and solutions and innovations that are available to be able to tackle some of these challenges. So welcome, thank you again. We look forward to the discussion and appreciate everyone participating. Great, thank you so much, Erin. Um, and now to start hearing about those challenges, we will turn to a really valued partner, especially in the area of technology and R&D who kept it real for us. We're very pleased to have Brian McSorley with Oxfam with us. He comes with a background in water resource systems engineering and more than 25 years experience in managing water and sanitation programs and teams responding to protracted humanitarian crises as well as long-term development. You're very welcome, Brian. Over to you. Thanks, Jason. So let me try and share my screen. So hopefully you can see my screen now. Yeah, we can, can see it. Me? Great. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be with you today. Um, and in the next 15 minutes, I'm, I'm gonna share some examples of Oxfam's sanitation work and the challenges we face during both the first phase of an emergency and within longer term humanitarian programs. To start with a bit of context, Beyond the obvious inconvenience and indignity of not having access to a toilet, people affected by humanitarian crises are particularly vulnerable to contracting infectious diseases due to the hardship 
trauma, stress that they may have been exposed to, and the changed environment that they find themselves in as a result of the conflict or natural disaster that has occurred. Um, and this will impact in different ways. The majority of people will actually either stay put or relocate and be hosted by friends or relatives, but a substantial number may have no other choice and be compelled to move into informal or managed camps, such as the one depicted in this photo. Um, and in these different contexts, sanitation services are at best stretched as existing services may have been damaged or destroyed, or more people are sharing the same facilities, or in the case of a new camp, facilities need to be built from scratch. And in all cases though, the, the risk of disease transmission increases. So it's of paramount importance that humanitarian organizations like Oxfam provide safe, clean water and sanitation facilities to, to maintain good public and, and environmental hygiene. I think it's fair to say that part of Oxfam's reputation and competence in humanitarian wash comes from the equipment and kits that we started developing in the 1980s and 90s to enable us to provide water and sanitation in emergencies quickly. Our supply center in Bicester in the UK, which I showed in the first slide, has around 1.5 million pounds worth of equipment that it claims can be air freighted anywhere in the world within 72 hours. And this ability to deploy kit, it, it's still part of our work. And currently, for example, our supply centers preparing an order for Central African Republic in relation to the ongoing um, refugees fleeing Sudan. Um, but it is much less significant than it used to be for, for reasons I'll explain in a minute. But first to illustrate what a sanitation program might look like, a typical response will start with shared public or communal toilets, which are gender segregated. The minimum standard that we're aiming for is to have a toilet within 50 meters of all dwellings and no more than 20 people sharing a toilet. Now with a, a sudden influx, it may be challenging to build toilets fast enough, so it will have to be phased. In Cox's Bazaar, Bangladesh, for example, half a million Rohingya refugees arrived in, in less than three months. So that's the equivalent of, of needing 25,000 latrines. Speed is critical, and that is possible using local contractors, as long as materials are available, so timber, plastic slabs, plastic sheeting, or, or corrugated iron sheets that, that you see in these photos. Some of my Oxfam predecessors have been instrumental in designing the self-supporting plastic keyhole slab, which is widely used during first phase emergencies. The one currently supplied via our um, procurement center is produced by a UK based company, Dunster House. There's many other similar products, all slightly different. We chose this one because um, of its lightweight and thin profile, making it easy to ship. It, it's rigid, it has minimum flex when you stand on it, durability, ease of cleaning and, and cost. Um, it's about 42 pounds, so equivalent to 50, 52 dollars. Um, but it's not perfect. A, a lot of thought has gone into the hinged lid, which is essential to reduce fly nuisance and odor. However, this is also a, a weak point. People don't like to touch it. it. It's designed so it can be operated with your foot, but it can easily get soiled. And, and in reality, it commonly gets left open, which defeats its purpose, and it can get damaged. For contexts where water is available and used for anal cleaning, it is possible to remove the lid and attach a, a pan with a, a U-bend and water seal, or indeed the sato pan. Um, so using the, the threaded bolt holes in, in the underneath of the, the slab. This graph shows sales of squatting slabs from our supply center over the last six years. The, as you see, the, the peaks reflect humanitarian crises. So 2017, Rohingya crisis. In 2019, there was Cyclone Idai. 
um, affecting Mozambique. So demand will always vary year to year, but there is a, a noticeable downward trend since 2017. We've supplied in, in total a um, little over 14,000 slabs to different humanitarian organizations. Um, but in the last 12 months, only 525 slabs were, were dispatched from our supply center. And if I was able to show a longer time series, um, the declining trend would be more noticeable and that the situation is similar across other wash equipment items. Um, here's some of the reasons for that. Much more procurement is done by individual country officers. It, it's much easier to source humanitarian items in, in local or regional markets now than in the past. And sourcing locally is a, a preferred solution. Air freight is obviously costly and increasingly import export processes delay delivery and increase transaction costs. And it's not uncommon that by the time items arrive in country, the context has changed and, and the needs have changed. So items might be no longer appropriate or, or required. Um, UN organizations such as UNICEF and UNHCR in some countries maintain contingency stocks that we can access. And also humanitarian responses are increasingly being led by local organizations who are less likely to be aware that international procurement is an option. So our field teams will, will make do with what they can get hold of, which might not always be the, the best option quality wise or, or technically. So back to our country sanitation programs. First phase emergency toilets are built with speed in mind. So sometimes at the expense of, of quality, plastic sheeting perishes quite quickly within, within a few months and plastic slabs also degrade. So these are not necessarily durable solutions. The top two photos are, are more permanent desludgeable latrines under construction, I think in South Sudan. Um, and if you look closely, uh, the, the top right photo, the, the blue pans, uh, this looks like we're, we're using uh, sato pans and, and these latrines. Um, we also know that people much prefer their own toilet at household level, which will have higher ownership and much more likely to be taken care of than communal toilets. So in a protracted humanitarian response, the aim is typically to transition from emergency shared public toilets to individual or, or shared household toilets as soon as possible. These dome ferrous cement slabs, which are widely used across East Africa, are cheap to construct and, and very durable, but it does take time to set up this type of production facility. And the full curing, strengthening of, of the cement takes several weeks before these can be used. This is another Oxfam sanitation program and a, a different context. Obviously, not all humanitarian responses are the result of a sudden shock. Much of Horn in East Africa is in chronic, slow onset, protracted crises that develop over months as, as rains fail and malnutrition rates rise. So these photos are 15 different households and 15 slightly different toilet designs in, in northern Kenya. But the one common feature is the slab. During community consultations, we learned that households were happy to dig latrine pits. They were able to build toilet superstructures using locally available materials, but they lacked the skills and resources to construct the latrine slabs. And this is quite common in, in many countries where timber is scarce or expensive, um, or its use is restricted due to deforestation concerns. Um, so in Kenya, although there are multiple producers of squatting slabs in Nairobi, by the time you transport them to rural areas, they were prohibitively expensive. Unfortunately, as a humanitarian community, we, we can and, and we do fall short more often than we're aware or would like to admit. In 2022, um, Oxfam research across 11 countries, refugee and IDP camps, confirmed that on average 40% of women and children are not using the emergency latrines that were built for them. And in some cases, latrines are adding to the, the public health risk. 
Now, lack of funding and insufficient number of latrines is partly to blame and undoubtedly a, a major factor. Where latrines are overcrowded and overused, good hygiene becomes more difficult to maintain and latrines can fill more quickly than they, they can be emptied or replaced. We also don't have to look far to find examples where user needs are simply not being met. And that could be due to protection concerns and women and children not feeling safe because of where latrines are located. It could be lack of privacy, absence of locks on doors, lack of lighting at night, embarrassment being seen, going to a toilet, queuing, poor hygiene, lack of, lack of cleaning. Um, and what is appropriate in one location doesn't necessarily mean it will be appropriate elsewhere, that the sanitation needs and solutions in Ukraine are different to Syria, which are different to sub-Saharan Africa or, or Bangladesh. Now, the, the main conclusion of this research was that most of the issues could have been avoided or resolved had good feedback mechanisms been in place. So community consultation and engagement is, is absolutely key. Um, just to finish off, in, in summary, th there's always a need for good quality, affordable equipment that enables humanitarian organisations to construct quality toilets quickly and at scale. I've not seen the new Sato slab myself, so I'm looking forward to listening to Daigo's presentation. Um, also, unlike many of Mark's and colleagues, I've, I've not used the, the, the Sato pan uh, but what I can say is that the issue of fly nuisance and odour associated with conventional keyhole squatting slabs that, that lack a water seal has been challenging for, for quite some years. And therefore, the Sato self-opening closing flap seems to offer potentially a, a very promising solution to that problem. Maybe just one note, note of caution as someone who's personally invested quite a lot of time um, and energy focusing on technical solutions, some of which are, are illustrated in, in the photos on this slide, only to realize there's really a, a magic bullet or technological quick fix. Um, these are te technologies certainly, and good products are part of the solution, but the biggest blockers to our work tend to be around funding and, and internal program quality issues. Um, so what's most important to me as a, as a program manager is, is quality, cost and availability of products and materials in local markets close to where demand is. So, so these are key determining factors influencing what we use in our programs. Um, the problem that we have as humanitarian responders is that we don't know when and where the next crisis will be, which I suspect make, makes us quite a, an unreliable and frustrating customer at times to our private sector suppliers and, and collaborators. Um, I'll stop there, hand back to, to Jason, but happy to answer questions Thanks. later. Thank you, Brian. Um, really appreciate the, the, the complexity of the, the challenges and the experiences as you shared. I mean, it's, it's going across everything from, you know, speed, um, perception, user needs and, and, and responding to those um, and how important the context is and the issues of funding and O&M. So there's a lot to get through in there and we really appreciate you setting the stage. As Brian mentioned, please put your questions in the chat um, and we'll try to get uh, to as many of them as possible at the end. And we're seeing a lot of great introductions from everyone. Thank you for that. Please, if you haven't introduced yourself, go ahead and uh, put that in the chat as well. Um, next, we are going to focus um, and go a little bit deeper into the sanitation response in Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh. Um, and with us, we have one of Sato's oldest partners who were instrumental in our launch and scale up in Bangladesh. And I'm very pleased to introduce Tanoi Dewan of BRAC. Tanoi is from a civil engineering and development studies background. He has many years of experience in WASH working with IDE, IFRC, and is the current role um, as the senior lead for Wash and Brack. A very warm welcome to you, Tanoi. The floor is yours. Thank you uh, for having me here today. Uh, thank you, Jason, and thank you, uh, Shato. Uh, and very uh, good afternoon and good evening. So I will I will take you uh, in Rohingya camps today, actually. Uh, so. 
let me share my presentation. Is my presentation visible? Yes, it is. Thank you very much again. So basically, uh, uh, I will be presenting the sanitation system that currently we, we are implementing in the camp. So uh, as you can see, the one of the photos that uh, I, I uh, attached here is about the you know, fecal sludge management treatment plan in the Cox Bazaar. This is one of the biggest uh, treatment plan in the Cox Bazaar uh, right now. So before uh, going to main presentations, I would like to uh, tell about the BRAC. So as you know, the BRAC is the largest NGO in the world, established in 1972 uh, by Sir Fofle Hassan Adai. So BRAC has its uh, footprint uh, in 19 countries with the mission to empower people and communities in situation of poverty, literacy, disease, and social injustice. So as you can see the global map and mostly the Europe, America, and, and the you know, UK OPCs are for the fundraising activities. And the other countries, we have uh, direct operations uh, uh, for, for humanitarian response development programs, which includes you know, microfinance, uh, education, et cetera. BRAC has also its country was program uh, over the country in Bangladesh, uh, including Pax budget, apart from the Rohingya response. And BRAC has been working with the Rohingya response from the very beginning of the influx. And the BRAC is happy to you know, uh, announce that the BRAC was the first responder with others and NGOs. Currently, we are continuously providing war services to over uh, 250,000 people. 11 camps in Cox Plaza. So as you can see uh, 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 in the slide, so basically we are implementing the whole sanitation value chain at this moment. So we, we didn't came uh, in these situations, not in a day, rather it took uh, five years to, to reach in these situations. As you can see with the blue color at the right, at the lab, uh, it's, the, it's the containment basically. Uh, it's a pit latrine. So we have a pot system, the direct pit latrine and the offset pit latrines. And uh, in some cases, we have also septic tank as a containment. And when the septic tank or containment is full, we actually use uh, centrifugal farms or mud farms to emptying the the slugs from the pit. We also use Bekutek to empty the uh, slugs pit. And uh, what about the transportation? So we will, I mean, we use uh, Bekutek and, and very recently we have actually uh, reached in a milestone. Uh, we have constructed intermediate fecal slugs transfer network which is shortly called IFSTN, for which we actually collect the sludge from the containment and the sludge goes directly into the uh, fecal sludge treatment plan that you can see at the right side. So what we do after the transportations, so we do have a fecal sludge treatment plan uh, outside of the camp and we have, they are the planted drying bed anaerobic buffalo reactors, anaerobic filter reactors, and the constructed wetland. So it doesn't mean that in the camp, we have uh, uh, all the systems we actually, you know, transform into these improved systems. We do have also a small, small uh, thicker slash treatment plan inside the camp. So this is something uh, that, the landscape of the of the Rohingya camps of uh, as you can see, the blue the color uh, 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 shaded. Those are the actually latrines. We uh, we 
been and you can uh, imagine that how it is difficult to manage those uh, you know latches in terms of you know uh, repair and maintenance and in terms of you know amp time when it is full and the right side you can see the you know one of the latches that we we build uh, and our uh, community volunteers are collecting the fecal sludge from the latch. Of course, uh, we have some challenges uh, to manage those facilities. So uh, one of the major challenges is about the lack of available space to build the uh, latching over the camps. So topography sometimes uh, uh, make us difficult to move the vehicles and equipment in the camps. And most importantly, facilities are non-permanent. They are, are very much exposed to the natural disasters like you know, cyclone, uh, landslide. And since they are very much uh, non-permanent, uh, they need you know, uh, frequent repair and maintenance. As you know, we have entered into the protected crisis and we need uh, uh, regular repair and maintenance of the wash facilities to keep those functional. One of the major problems right now in the Rohingya camps is funding crisis for the regular operation and maintenance. And the, the last one is about lack of uniformity of the sanitation solution. It's not that much challenge for us, but um, sometimes it happens because as a BRAC, as an implementing agency, if, uh, basically we do have projects from different donors agencies and donor agency have uh, different, different sanitation technology, which we implement uh, uh, in the field. So sometimes it makes us difficult. And uh, uh, from our thought actually to, overcome those challenges, uh, I tried to put some, uh, you know, way forward. Uh, uh, the, the one uh, that I want to start is explore opportunities for the private sector engagement. As I mentioned that uh, there is a funding crisis in the Rohingya camps. So it's not only for the business purpose, uh, not only the, to promote the product, but also to, to, to assess is there any uh, uh, opportunity uh, for the private sector engagement. And of course, we need a strong uh, advocacy with the government for the planning of the durable sanitation solutions that will definitely the disaster resilience and which require less uh, repair and maintenance. Uh, we often talk about the technology innovation, but we also talk about the innovation of their process. We need a strong community engagement for the sustainability. And finally, but not the least, adopting a blending approach to deal with the long-term crisis. So we uh, usually uh, have the approach for the relief. So we need to think about the different approach, how we can actually you know, make sustainable program, uh, especially for the long-term crisis. And finally, we sincerely acknowledge the contribution of our partners. And I will stop here and I will back to the session and audience if you have any questions so far. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Tenoy. Very informative as well. Um, I think we all appreciate the fact that you're looking at the whole sanitation value chain um, in the camps. And also it's interesting to see some of the very similar challenges that, that Brian touched on also coming out um, from that experience. Is, Funding, space, speed, again, um, applicability in the local context, uh, the users and, and community needs as well. Um, please keep the questions coming. I see several coming in right now. Um, it also looks like we have about eight participants, at least in Cox's Bazaar. And I see Rashidul's trying to reach out to you to have a meeting. So I think that's also excellent to keep the uh, conversation going forward. Uh, finally, our, our last speaker, and Daigo, um, we're doing great on time, so you can relax. Um, is uh, Daigo Ishiyama, and Daigo is the innovation leader for Sato. 
Um, and with a background in mechanical engineering and industrial design, Daigo has been with the company for over 20 years at Sato. He is the mastermind behind product development and design, having created a range of sanitation and hygiene solutions. And he and his team are increasingly look at looking at humanitarian settings and responses. So with that, welcome, Daigo. It's all yours. Yeah, thank you, Jason. Uh, thank you, Brian. Thank you, Tanoi, uh, for those great background on the humanitarian needs. Um, so yeah, I'm Daigo. I'm based in uh, East Coast New, uh, US, um, and I'm the, the leader of innovation for Sato. Uh, next slide, please. And welcome, everyone. Uh, so Sato products have been used um, in the humanitarian uh, setting for, uh, for a long time. And I, I wanna start by um, introducing um, to you like how our products have been used in different contexts. Uh, for the Rohingya camp uh, in Aksbazar, uh, we've uh, shipped uh, thousands of, of pants, I think over 5,000 pants uh, in the 2017 uh, timeframe to help with the construction of, of uh, 6,000 latrines, uh, helping uh, 125,000 refugees. So that's in Bangladesh, uh, in Nepal, uh, in the during the Gorkha earthquake, um, I think it was around 2015, we've donated uh, 10,000 uh, Sato pants to WaterAid uh, for the, to aid with the construction of latrines after the earthquake. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, and after uh, the super typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, uh, I think that was in the 2013, 14 timeframe, uh, we've uh, shipped close to 30,000 uh, Sato pants to UNICEF uh, to aid with the construction of the, the latrine construction uh, for the aftermath of the, the very devastating uh, Typhoon Haiyan. And for COVID response, uh, mainly uh, for the taps uh, to aid with the, the hand washing um, and for the uh, for the communities, uh, we've shipped 400,000, uh, over 400,000 uh, units of Sato taps uh, with the behavior change. And um, if you remember, um, the hand washing is one of the, the cheapest and the most effective ways to prevent the, the spread of COVID-19. Um, so in that effort, uh, we've shipped many uh, Sato taps to the communities through many partners uh, for the COVID response. So these are some of the examples that we've done um, for the, the humanitarian response efforts um, in the past. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, but like uh, Brian was uh, was alluding to, um, this humanitarian um, response in these refugee camps that um, that are being built ends up being a very long term. Uh, resident for many, many um, people in the camps. So um, eventually they're gonna want to build their own latrines. Uh, each household would wanna build their own latrines that they don't um, have to share with other households. Um, similarly, in like for those of you that don't know uh, how Sato pans work, um, the trap door mechanism that Erin was, was alluding to, um, these are some of the, um, the typical challenges that we face. Uh, the toilet you see here is very basic um, with, you know, a lot of the times just a hole in the ground. And you can imagine the stench and the, the insects, you know, the, that might fly around. Um, you might, you know, see through the whole, the human waste um, and a lot of the fly lar larvae that may be breeding inside the human, human waste. And it, it's just not a very, uh, not a pleasant experience to use these toilets. So what we do is we make these, you know, um, these Sato uh, toilets uh, equipped with these trap door at the bottom. So it's a counterweighted system where um, it stays closed all the time. So it's self-closing and only when poop or flush water or anything solid that can overcome that counterweight hits the door, it opens and it automatically shuts again. Um, so this door mechanism is really simple, uh, but as long as there's gravity, the door would keep closing. So, you know, it doesn't require any springs or gears or any, you know, complicated mechanism that may break. Uh, it's as simple as it gets uh, in terms of, of mechanism. And so what this does, it's really, uh, it shuts that hole 
Um, and so visually, uh, it shuts that, you know, the view into the pit, which a lot of the kids are afraid of. Um, and by, by closing the door, um, it, it eliminates the smell from coming up um, and the insects from, you know, going in, in and out the pit, uh, infecting the people around uh, that toilet, you know, with possibility of spreading uh, diarrheal diseases, you know, by carrying the pathogens from the human waste. And it, uh, it requires very little water to use. Um, so, you know, if you, if you can, you know, um, have a liter of water, you can flush with that much water. Um, and on this slide, um, this is an example of, of us installing Sato Pants in, in school settings. Um, so, you know, in schools too, um, you know, a lot of the kids, the school kids are afraid of using um, the toilets because they fear they might fall into the, into the hole or maybe that dark hole is, is very scary for, for them. But by installing these Sato pans and stools, um, you know, it lets the kids, you know, um, you know use uh, the toilet by themselves. You know, they're very happy to use the toilets. It doesn't smell bad. You know, the, uh, the uh, insects and flies are no longer around. So it provides them with a good sort of um, um, experience that they wanna keep using over and over again. And this puts dignity to everyone, including the kids, uh, that they don't have to have any adults, um, the grown-ups, you know, uh, accompanying them into the toilet. Uh, and they can do this by themselves. They they feel proud, um, and it's good for everyone. You know, the faculty members don't have to assist the the kids, you know, into the toilet. So uh, overall, um, you know, this can work for anyone, uh, for kids, uh, for elderly people. Um, so we always have these, these human you know, centric design process in place uh, that we don't leave anyone behind. Anyone can use our toilets uh, happily and pleasantly. So next slide, please. So taking the solutions a step further um, into the safety managed sanitation, um, so we've taking that trap door solution and put that in a more sort of this systematic uh, approach. Um, so this picture here um, is when we, um, when we tried the V-trap system in India. So in India, the twin pit uh, uh, toilet construction was, was promoted by the government of India uh, throughout the SDM uh, program. And this V-trap was, was developed to facilitate the construction of twin pit latrines. So this V-trap system really you know, has two pipe connections um, and the V-trap itself is a switching mechanism that you can really easily switch from one pit to another by just you know, an insertion of a stick into the toilet and with a flick. So within seconds, you can switch pits between uh, pit A and pit B. And also coupling that with the Sato pit liner, uh, we've identified the, the uh, pit lining by bricks by masons is a very labor intense, uh, very costly um, uh, process for the household. So to eliminate that pain point, uh, we've developed this uh, Sato pit liner that can be assembled in minutes and dropped into the pit, um, providing a lining, a very strong lining uh, for the pits so that the pit walls the, uh, won't collapse into the pits. So the pit liners aren't available yet. Uh, we've just uh, concluded the long-term um, testing in India in, uh, in late March. So we look to commercialize this pit liner uh, later in the year or uh, early next year. Um, but you know th this is part of the growing uh, product portfolio that we're developing as a innovation team. And this is, you know, to give you more context of how the pit liner will be installed. Uh, this is the design version one uh, of the pit liner. Uh, we have the improved design version two, uh, uh, you know, uh, gathering the learnings from this exercise, uh, from this testing we did uh, a couple of years ago uh, in India. So we have the design two and then, um, and then furthermore, so we've developed the design three, which we're gonna commercialize later this year or early next year. Next slide, please. 
Yes. So, um, so again, you know, we're growing our portfolio. Um, we have the hand washing solution that is the Sato Tap Two, um, the stool, um, or the, the many different versions of the pan, and the connection systems like the I trap and the V trap, and now the new Sato slab that that I would like to talk about um, in the next slides. So the Sato's. Um, so yeah. So this. Uh, the slab is, you know, like Brian uh, touched on, is very much needed in the emergency response uh, effort. So the slabs are usually the first, you know, thing that need, they need to build a latrine, uh, th th this very um, durable floor material that's easy to clean, that's easy to install, and can be in use immediately. So for that, we've developed this, this slab material. Um, this fits very well with the, um, the UN requirement. Um, we've studied the UNICEF and the UNHCR um, RFQ documents, and we've made our products to those specs. Um, so we're introducing four SKUs uh, for now. Uh, so the Sato 701 is a 1.2 meter by 800 um, or 80 centimeter slab um, that can mount um, that can nest this Sato pan. Um, you know, like Brian was saying, uh, this uh, self-closing has been a challenge in, um, in the humanitarian settings, but this, by nesting the Sato pan right into the, into the slab with, with very easy installation, this provides a very good footing for the, uh, for the toilet and also the self-closing mechanism that the Sato pan brings to the toilet. So the 702 version mounts a, um, a stool over that. So if, um, if your mobility challenge or if you, know, uh, you prefer the sitting position while you're defecating, you can easily mount the 702 over the 701 and that provides a sitting position while you're defecating. And the 703 um, is the, uh, the skew with the collection box that fits from underneath that you can attach a pipe to. So this black box you see underneath the slab is the pipe attachment. Um, so it provides the same benefits like the 701, but with the pipe attachment, if you want the, the pit to be offset from the, where the latrine is. And 704 uh, mounts the, the stool over 703. So um, if you prefer a sitting position and the offset pit, um, or if you want to connect the, you know, the toilet to a septic tank or any local you know, sewer line, then you can do that with the pipe connection. So it's a combination of things, but uh, these four are what we decided uh, to launch now, uh, mainly for humanitarian uh, response purpose. But this portfolio can grow depending on the need and you know what systems we connect uh, to these uh, to the slab. So the specifications: um, the the slab itself is about ten kilos, ten to eleven kilos uh, in weight. Uh, it's made of HDPE, uh, and the costing for now, uh, uh, FOB uh, China would be um, anywhere from sixty-five to eighty dollars, as you see in these charts. And yeah, so um, the and the minimum uh, order quantity is two thousand. Uh, again, this is because of the. Um, the humanitarian response, this mainly the humanitarian response um, needs, um, but you know we can um, we can try to satisfy you know um, uh, the orders you know, as they come. So uh, please contact us for any questions. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, the the slab, um, as as I've been saying. Um, this, you know, the slab has been designed to the UN requirements, including UNHCR. Um, it's got the self-closing mechanism. Um, it's very quick to, uh, to install. It's sturdy. We've tested to uh, the 150 kilogram weight requirement uh, at, the, at, the, at the middle, um, and it, it performs very well. It's uh, self-supporting with minimal support um, that the UNHCR, you know, um, Requires uh, it does very well in that supporting you know structure, um, and it is um, you know it is you know it's available with or without a stool, 
um, and in many variations like, you know, like uh, explained before. Next slide, please. Yeah, and so, so the Sato pen uh, benefits, again, to summarize, um, it's, you know, the Sato pens are self-closing and it cuts out smell and insects um, and it, it flushes it with, with very little water, uh, less than one liter of water. Um, and what that does is it shuts out a um, uh, uh, view of the pit. Um, and again, you know, the stool can be mounted for, uh, for children, elderly, or in a reduced mobility population. Next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, the, as a concept, and we have many um, uh, innovation projects that we're working on, uh, but if you put them all together, you know, with the superstructure, the slab, um, the twin pit systems, and the pit liner, you know, it could look something like this, you know, where we can uh, provide the end-to-end -end solution um, for the sanitation needs. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so if uh, if you can scan this QR code, um, uh, you know you can find more information about the slab and how to install and all of this. So please, um, you know, please scan this code for more information. Yeah, and that's it for me. Uh, thank you very much uh, for listening. Um, and we look uh, forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, Daigo. Appreciate all those options. Um, and we're going to put that information again at the end if you if you want to get in touch. So if you missed scanning the code, uh, we will put it up again at the very end. So great. We have some time for some questions. And so we're going to start with those. Um, and I'll just read a couple out and let the presenters respond. Uh, Brian, if I can start with you um, and give you two, if that's OK. Um, and then you can respond. The first one is from Nat. Uh, I know Sato has done quite a bit of work understanding the consumer preference for latrines and hand washing facilities. Do you go through a similar process for humanitarian contexts? And the second question is from Chukwuma. Beyond challenges in ensuring availability of affordable and quality toilet products, what was your experience in getting skilled artisans to provide these sanitation facilities in target locations? Okay, um, let me start on the second one first. It's fresh in my memory and, and maybe easier to, to answer. Um, I, I would say finding skilled artisans is not normally a problem. Um, it could be from within the affected displaced population. It could be from um, artisans within the hosting community. Um, and it would quite likely be local contractors in, in those affected areas. Um, with, with more complex um, systems, if, if we can't find skilled artisans locally, we would have to look further afield. Um, our, our preference would be to, to give um, employment opportunities Keep, keep that locally, but if we have to search further, we, we would. I, th I think maybe the, the, the bigger problem is, is around um, pricing and, and negotiating just to ensure we get value for money um, and, and don't get e exploited in that way. And, and yeah, but often there is a lot of um, humanitarian agencies working alongside each other, so inevitably somehow competing for for, for, for limited skills and resources, but we, we normally manage to, to work out. Um, in terms of the customer needs, um, we, we, we aim to and we should do. So it, it's very much a, a mantra, um, community consultation and community engagement. It's certainly something we're, we're pushing, we have been pushing increasingly over a number, last number of years. Um, but when you go and visit some field operations, you can see that it's not always taking place. I, I, I think there's, there's obviously an urgency to build sanitation facilities as, as quickly as possible. So inevitably some assumptions have to be made, but our hope would be that as soon as the first facilities have been constructed, we would then consult with users who would feedback. And as it becomes apparent 
um, certain weaknesses or areas that are not meeting people's needs, we would then be able to adapt. Um, practically, that can be challenging if we've issued a big contract to, to, to a contractor to build a thousand toilets to, to then vary contracts. So the, the, there are complexities, but that's what we aim to do. And, and obviously, one of the constraints in the field is, is limited resources. Um, so having the, 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 the time to, to be able to, to do that follow up and consultation. Great, uh, thank you, Brian. Um, and Tenoy, um, I'm wondering if I can also give you two questions that came up for you. Uh, the first one is also from Nat. Um, were there any political legal challenges with the government of Bangladesh in building infrastructure to support the camps? Some countries didn't want to have significant infrastructure in humanitarian camps. And the second one is from Jimmy. Regarding safely managed sanitation, for BRAC, what guidelines and standards are in use for ensuring full sanitation value chain use in the camps? Thank you, Jason. And thank you, uh, Jimmy and Matt, for the question. So I will go for the first question. Uh, basically, you know, I would definitely say that our go government is very much helpful for the Rohingya response in Cox Bazaar. Yes, sometimes they are very much reluctant to build the permanent structure. But of course, this is not for the uh, point of politicals, rather it's, it's from the perspective of the environment. But uh, of course, sometimes they suggest us the alternative solutions as well. And the second question for, for the Jimmy, uh, uh, yes, we have the standard, we have very much a strong coordination uh, in the in the sector. We have was sector here, and the was sector has unified sanitation uh, design technology, where we have all the sanitation solutions uh, proposed from different organizations, and this is actually approved by the government. And most importantly, was sector in coordination with the brand. We are currently developing the fetal sludge uh, management strategy. Uh, probably it will be the Bible for us. The, all the tactical standards will be there. And for the uh, EPLAN monitoring systems, we actually follow the you know, Department of Environment Bangladesh guidelines. I think I have been able to answer what question. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Tenoy. And we still have a little bit of time. Daigo, I'm gonna throw a couple questions to you. Um, this is from Robert. I imagine the surface of the pan must need to be very smooth to be flushed with minimal amounts of water. How durable is it? Estimated lifespan? Yeah, uh, thank you, Robert, uh, for the question. Um, so the, yeah, the pan surface, uh, we specified the polish on the mold um, for every pan or the, or the stool. Uh, to ensure the smoothness of the surface. Um, and what was it? Uh, the How durable is it? Um, yeah, so it um, it is plastic. So, you know, if you can imagine a very smooth plastic, you know, that would be, you know, the, the surface of our products. But uh, we make sure we have proper thicknesses and um, the, the strength, you know, to last a long time. For instance, we've been... Um, we've been uh, selling our Sato pans in Bangladesh since 2013, and we know uh, um, a lot of the pans are still in service from back then. So, uh, in under proper use, it can last a long time. Great, thanks. Um, and then there's another one. I think this would go to you, Daigo and Brian, uh, if you could take a look at it. Uh, so it's from Brian, and it says uh, Brian Reed. Slabs are only as strong as their foundation. What steps are needed to ensure a decent construction process? Yeah, Do you want to start I'm, by I'm I'll just Yeah, I'll just go. Um, so I think this is more uh, for the installation of the slab um, at the humanitarian site. Um, and you're perfectly right. Uh, this The slab only is as strong as the structure below it. Um, so we follow um, the guidance of the, the procurement uh, programs. 
um, to make the slab itself as durable as possible under the specified uh, support structure uh, that is common in humanitarian settings. And whether that's properly done or not is, you know, we have to go to the site and, you know, just, um, just rely on the installers doing the installations to do the right thing that the product is made, meant to, to do and perform under. So with that, maybe Brian can, um, can you know, uh, give us some light on, um, on how the, what the reality is on the ground in the humanitarian sites. Yeah, I think <laughs> Brian, Brian Reed knows as much or, or more about these things than, than me. So yeah, can probably answer his own question. I, I would say, um, yeah, for, for first phase latrines, the, the, the weight of the, the superstructure and the plastic slab um, is, is not so significant. Um, our, our engineers would obviously assess the, the soil conditions um, and, and speak to, to, to local people um, to find out what the, the soil conditions are like and whether any um, lining is, is needed for, for those pits. Um, obviously, lining would be um, more likely for, for some of the, the longer term, more durable solutions where you're using heavier permanent um, superstructures. Um, and if you're um, intending to, to de-sludge the latrines, obviously then you'd, you'd need to think about stabilizing the, the walls. Um, line has obviously significantly increased the, the cost of, of um, communal or, or household latrines. Um, but yeah, I, I guess assess every context on its on its merits, and and quality control in terms of um, the the production of the concrete slabs, um, whether they're reinforced concrete or, or non reinforced. Good, thank you both. Uh, and one more for you, Daigo. Uh, from Rupiet, um, during the very beginning of any humanitarian setting, is it feasible to set a slab, whereas water scarcity is a question at the time? So in situations where there where water is scarce. Yeah, thank you for the question. I think uh, the water scarcity um, is different in every, uh, every site and every installation, but um, from what we understand from um, the needs of the humanitarian sites. Um, you know, this self-closing mechanism is very important. Um, you know, our understanding is that there's some water uh, that can be used for, for sanitation. And I think I saw one question where, you know, even for offset pit, you know, is it is one liter enough to carry the waste um, to the pit? Uh, in our testing, it is. Uh, we've tested, um, this this scenario uh, in our labs, um, and also we've been selling these offset pit solutions in in uh, in in the regions, and we've had um, a good success with people using minimal water to flush the waste and carry the waste to the pit. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question, but um, you know, so the direct pit setup where you just drop the waste into the into the pit. Um, which is what I understand is is what's being done commonly in the humanitarian response right after, you know, right in the beginning of the response is, you know, you dig a trench and you put these slabs over the trench um, and it's a direct pit setting. So uh, for that, you sometimes don't need um, water just to flush, you know, with the weight of the poop, you know, the door opens and it lets the, lets the, um, the, um, uh, the waste, you know, uh, drop through. So in that case, you just need a little bit of water to rinse the stains um, that may be on the pan or, or on the door. So it can be used with very little water. And if you are, uh, if you do anal cleansing, that water is sometimes enough to rinse away um, the waste on the surface. So it can be a very um, sato products, you know, sato pans can be a very efficient um, products to install in the first uh, response, even in the most water stressed regions. 
Great, Daigo, and if you could hold on, um, we're gonna do two more questions and then we'll have to start wrapping up, but one's for you and then one will be for Tanoi. So uh, Daigo, this is from Linux uh, over LinkedIn. How do you ensure public health standards are met regarding with regards when you design um, and construct of latrines facilities in humanitarian settings? So maybe this is another one for you to start um, and perhaps Brian then to pick up on. <laughs> Yeah, so this is a very good question. Um, you know, sanitation um, is means to an end. Like, you know, like Aaron alluded to, like we want to make sure the users, you know, um, can live a better life every day. Um, and that goes to health and well-being of every user that we that we serve. Um, so um, we, we know that um, the insects can be a... Um, a spreader of diarrheal diseases and it can carry the pathogens to the human from the human waste to the human environment. Right? So the to shut that off is a very effective way of preventing you know, diarrheal diseases uh, for the communities. So we know this. So I think um, you know the health benefits um, you know uh, is a result of the sanitation um, efforts that we do and you know we would like to learn more about these uh, in a more humanitarian settings um, you know how these you know sanitation um, you know safe sanitation can provide better you know health benefits you know for the users but um, you know we know what we know we don't know what we don't uh, but you know I think from what we know uh, we're off to the right step uh, with these sato solutions for the humanitarian settings um, and with that, maybe Brian, you know, Tano, you can um, you can take over and uh, and share your experience. Yeah, I can add a little bit. Um, so we would typically have hygiene promotion a team um, working alongside our our engineers, um, engaging with users and and communities of those facilities just to ensure that the upkeep and and maintenance of um, toilet facilities and the surrounding environment so that would encourage cleanup campaigns for, for public toilets it may be necessary to have um, attendance paid attendance to ensure um, daily cleaning or on a, a, a regular basis um, and this is another reason why transitioning towards household latrines which individual households take responsibility for is a, a preferred longer solution because that household will will take ownership um, for, for the upkeep and, and, and long term cleaning. Yeah, if I add something to the question from the next. So basically, uh, the wash intervention with the aims of to improve public health situations. So uh, as uh, you, you, you have seen in my presentation, that is why we actually, you know, uh, are implementing the uh, full value, full sanitation value center. So that uh, our wash facilities, I mean, the sanitation facilities is not overflowing. And then the, you know, the standard are, are maintained so that no outbreak and no disease are spread and people uh, get uh, well, well conditions and a better life. Thank you. Thanks, Tenoy. And, and final question uh, to you from, from my team actually is how can we foster better collaboration between suppliers and partners within the humanitarian sector? If you're okay taking that. Sorry, yes. Is it me to take this question? Yeah, it, it would be great. Okay. Um, I think we have so can much you, interest in Bangladesh and, and many collaborators there. So if you could take that. Can thank you repeat you. again the question? Sure. Because how can we foster, um, there it disappeared. How can we foster better collaboration between suppliers and partners within the humanitarian sector? Yeah, basically uh, we do have our own procurement team. So the way we work actually, you know, uh, we, in collaboration with our uh, uh, procurement team, uh, jointly we do procurement for the wash. So probably uh, uh, what the, how we can start is if the assessment of the private sector, who, who are the you know major suppliers in the country, 
and as as well as the product we need, uh, we should have our own assessment. What kind of product we can actually uh, bring from from abroad? So that assessment can also be done. So if any product that match with the with the you know uh, our response, so that we can uh, uh, quickly you know uh, quickly procure that that product for the human species. Thank you. Thank you, Tanoy. And I can see from a couple of comments, we could probably have a whole webinar on that subject and, and procurement. Um, so maybe that's something for the future. Um, but for now, we actually we need to wrap up. Um, and I see that many of you have experiences and ideas and approaches. Um, we really want to keep this discussion going. Please reach out. Um, I think Jan's going to put up some additional contacts and, and things you can scan right now so that we can uh, get those in if you missed them last time. And then also, just before we wrap up, uh, you'll see a brief poll with four questions. Um, we'd really appreciate if you could take a moment to fill that in. Thank you. There it is. Um, and there's the contacts. Great. Um, and for now, we are out of time. So um, thanks to our speakers for sharing your knowledge and experience. Thanks for our team for organizing this event. Um, I think we've just scratched the surface, but please stay in touch. And most of all, thanks to all our participants, each and every one of you for joining today. Um, stay safe and have a great day or evening wherever you are. Thanks so much. Thank you very much.